Jesus said, consider the lilies of the field. In New England, we might say, consider the daffodils. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you. Hi, my name is Ed Horstman and welcome to the online service of worship from Round Hill Community Church in Greenwich, Connecticut. We're delighted that you've joined us for this online experience of worship and we look forward to staying connected with you in this way. I wanna begin this message, these words of welcome with a word of gratitude to um, the members of the staff at Round Hill Community Church, congregation leaders, all of you, everyone who made it possible for me to step back for the month of February, part one of the sabbatical and begin a season of rest and renewal. It was a wonderfully refreshing and renewing time and I am deeply grateful for it and deeply grateful for everyone who has made it possible. So thank you. I was also really excited to come back to work and to see all of the wonderful initiatives that are underway, both for the coming months and a little bit further down the road. So on March 11th, for example, we'll be having a spring fling, a garden themed gathering to welcome a new season with good friends, old and new, time to give a toast to a healthy and happy new year and to celebrate the ongoing good work of the church. So that's happening on March the 11th, spring fling. There will be another breakfast run, a service opportunity on March the 25th. And that's part of an organization called Midnight Run. It's a ministry of hospitality with the houseless in New York City. A group of Round Hill Community Church members and friends went earlier, actually last year, and now we're going again in March. This will be our second run to host and serve a hot breakfast, as well as give out toiletries and items of clothing. So, it's a really important ministry, and we're so fortunate that people from our congregation are stepping up to become part of that. Very good news also that the Reverend Shannon White will be leading a spiritual pilgrimage in October along the Camino de Santiago, known as the Way of St. James. This is an ancient pilgrimage path. It passes through parts of France and Portugal and Spain, all culminating at the Cathedral de Santiago de Compostela. So very excited to have that happening. And also on March the 26th, following worship, there will be a baby shower for Lizzie Sid, who is our co-coordinator of Children's Ministries. We're very happy for Lizzie and her family. And so that will be happening after worship. Information about all these events can be found on our website, roundhillcommunitychurch.org. Up-to-date information about opportunities for learning and serving and growing in our faith. Once again, welcome to each and every one of you. And together with people of faith and hope and love who long for peace and justice across the world, let us worship God. Let us pray. O oh God, before whose face we are not made righteous even by being right, Free us from the need to justify ourselves by our own anxious striving, that we may be abandoned to faith in you alone. Through Jesus Christ, amen. And let us pray together as Jesus taught his disciples to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 6, verses 25 through 29. These are the words of Jesus. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not clothed like one of these. In the name of God, the Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, amen. If we took all the stories of Jesus, all that he said and all that was said about him, and removed all of the references to nature in them, the remaining material would make for a very lean story about this man and his message. His ministry began outdoors with his baptism in a river. Before he ever preached or healed or taught, he devoted 40 days at the beginning of his ministry to a time in the desert, one of the most severe climate regions on the face of the earth. He used mud as a paste, which he then applied to a person's eyes to cure him of blindness. He was always talking about seeds. I imagine that he always had seeds in his hands, rolling them around, thinking of seeds as ideas and thoughts to be implemented. He traveled with his disciples on lakes and seas. He ascended mountains where he took time to be apart with God by himself. He often referenced flowers and birds and animals in his teachings. Jesus was wide open to the world of nature around him. He drew it into his life and his teaching. He relied on the elements of nature to provide wisdom about how to live a good life. So much so that I think if it can be said that Jesus is the heart and soul of Christianity, then maybe his interaction with nature was the heart and soul of Jesus' spirituality. The place where he found grounding, the place where he interacted with God. Nature wasn't just a pleasant backdrop to his stories. It was a guide. It was the place where he felt himself centered, where he drew inspiration for his teaching. 1,200 years after Jesus' life and death and resurrection, a man named St. Francis of Assisi took that interaction seriously and brought nature into his own life, made it a vital part of his own ministry, became one of the first environmentalist activists. In the scripture lesson that I read this morning, Jesus portrayed flowers as an example of living things who live without anxiety. And this is a theme that's sometimes picked up in the poetry of Wendell Berry, who's a Kentucky farmer and poet. And one of his poems where he talks about the grace and beauty of wild things, he, he talks about the way that when he becomes anxious, he gets close to wild things, goes down to the water where the birds are. And he says, I want to be close to those who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. Consider the lilies of the field, said Jesus. That word consider in ancient Greek is a strong verb. It means to learn something thoroughly, right down to a point. Today we would talk about it as comprehensive learning. And the verb also has this resonance of the experience of gazing at something intently. Uh, As a coach might watch a game and focus on one particular player and study that person and how that person is managing in the midst of an athletic contest or how a poet might view the world with a particular intensity or an artist. All of these meanings are contained in this verb to consider. Now it's the kind of thinking that the writer Near Ely describes in his book, Deep Work, which is all about how to 
recover a spirit of, of attentiveness, of focused attention in a very distracted world. When I was in high school, my 10th grade biology class was taught by a man named Gail Harrington, and I treasure his teaching this day because he taught us how to consider the world of nature. He was one of the few teachers I ever had, especially science teachers, who expected us to get outside the building, to go on field trips, to interact with nature, to study specimens, to sketch them, to collect them. He wanted us to consider carefully the world around us and to learn from it. And to this day, I feel that I have benefited from that teaching and applied it to other areas of my life. Since we don't have access to the same kind of lilies with which Jesus was familiar in his lifetime, or at least I think we don't, maybe we can use something a little closer to home to understand what he was getting at when he said, consider the lilies of the field. So why not consider the daffodils? What do we know about them? I did a little bit of, of uh, studying about daffodils and learned a few things. For example, there are bulbs of daffodils that have been found in the tombs of ancient Egypt. In fact, one pharaoh was discovered in his tomb with daffodil bulbs in his eye sockets because this was a symbol of rebirth and new life and he wanted those elements to be close to him. Daffodils are the national symbol of Wales. There are 27,000 varieties of them. And interestingly enough, not everything about daffodils is completely great. For example, please don't mistake the bulb of a daffodil for an onion. Apparently it's happened, but not a good thing to do. I've done the research on it, trust me. And they're not always great at healing. They can cause nausea, and something called daffodil itch if you get a little too close to them for a prolonged period of time. Doesn't sound good. And yet, and yet, they've been associated with rebirth and new life for thousands of years. Here's the main thing. Daffodil flowers are not out for long. But wow, what an impact. Every year, just when winter seems like it's saying to us, uh-uh, not yet, I'm not done with you yet, someone will come into the church office and say, you know what, I saw my first daffodil today, and everyone's mood will be boosted. They signal hope, which is why many organizations dedicated to cures for cancer often use daffodils as their symbol, and they're wise to do so. They represent this resurging hope that we feel, especially every year when winter can seem like it's most entrenched. Part of the lesson, I think, also to be learned from daffodils is that we don't always have to be going full tilt to make a big impact on the world. For 48 weeks of the year, daffodil bulbs are dormant. They're getting ready. They're out of sight. But out of sight doesn't mean absent or inactive, it just means out of sight. It's as if they're slowly, slowly gathering energy, getting ready for just the right time to make their appearance. When those yellow flowers do begin to blossom, they have the power to banish the winter blues, to pull us a little more deeply into springtime hope. They don't last long, but even their brief time on stage can help us to move more confidently and buoyantly into the future. Daffodils also have this sense of rhythm. They're underground for a long period of time, then they're above ground, and this is the annual rhythm in which they live. They understand how to withdraw, and they understand, how, or how to rest, and then they understand how to push forward. I'm thinking about putting a new message on my voicemail, something like this. Sorry, can't answer your call right now. I'm dormant for the time being, gathering energy, but I'll be back in touch when I'm in full bloom. And Eric Samuel would encourage me to do that. He's a pastor who works with churches who are looking for new ways to live out their faith. And he recommends that we make daffodil experiments. A daffodil experiment starts by taking an idea it could be an idea about almost anything, how to make the world a, little, a better place, how to make it a more beautiful place, how to repair a relationship. And he said, that idea, that's the bulb. 
And then give yourself time to think about it, to ruminate on it, to consider it. That's the deep work. That's putting the bulb in the ground, letting it be dormant for a while. And then when that idea is ready, let the flowers do what they want to do. Let them blossom. Let the idea come forth and celebrate it when it happens. Hope for Haiti is an organization that follows this model. Now, every year, Hope for Haiti organizes and promotes a fundraiser to support their work in Haiti. Now, their mission is primarily to support educational and medical initiatives that are essential for the people of Haiti. So every year they organize this one fundraiser which is called the Hike for Haiti. And it, it begins every year on April 1st, it ends on April 30th, it lasts only four weeks. And all anyone has to do to get involved is to make a small donation or a large donation you can commit to walking at, for some part of the month or hiking or taking a jog, uh, to exercising in some way as a way to participate more fully in this fundraiser. So here's the thing, for 48 weeks of the year, Hike for Haiti is kind of in the dormant stage. It's, it's time of planning, organizing, encouraging, drawing people into this process and then for four weeks, kind of like the daffodils, they blossom. This whole project blossoms. Over the years, Hike for Haiti, this one promotion, has raised several hundred thousand dollars just by encouraging people to prepare well and blossom at just the right time. Thinking that we can only do something small, we sometimes choose not to do anything at all. It just doesn't seem like we're gonna have that impact that we want to have. And yet, daffodils teach us otherwise. Again, for 48 weeks or more out of the year, they're, they're really in their resting state. They're blossoming for only a small part of the year, and yet it's so significant. I think Mother Teresa had a saying which perhaps illustrates what daffodils can do. She used to say, you know, we can't always do great things, but we can do small things with great love. And I get the sense that daffodils understand this. When I consider daffodils, I see the wisdom of nature at work. And I see the courage in nature at work. Daffodils blossom when the world is not daffodil ready. But into the cold air they come. I've seen daffodils push up through hard ground while winter is still in full force. I've seen them get covered by snow, survive icy rainstorms, yet year after year they rise up and protest as if to say, beauty and hope will not be denied. And that's how it can be for us too. We will be called upon, so often in life, to show our love in similarly unreceptive climates and practice our faith when the environment is hostile. But beauty is needed most precisely at those times when beauty is most threatened. So the daffodils are also encouraging us to wait for that right time when the idea, the hope, the action can spring forth and bring hope to other people. So consider the lilies, by all means, but consider the daffodils too. Consider the trust that it takes to wait all year long, 48 weeks, the energy they contain in their small bodies, and then how they show their faith and their courage by rising above ground even while winter walks the land. How they are there year after year after year to bring hope. Consider the daffodils. Amen. Let us pray. We come, O oh brooding, loving, timeless maker of all, because we have known your presence within, growing since our birth. Yet you are also exultingly announced in every equation, every galaxy, every neutron and helical molecule, in all nobleness and fitness, 
and in the unutterable mystery of Jesus the Christ, born of the Jews. We seek the white-hot intensity of life kindled by your hand in the Christ, vindicating all rightness and every right. We marvel at things as they are. Humbly and hesitantly, we seek to know our own part in the continual work of creating. First lifted into life by your power and love, we celebrate that life freely rising within us. Thus we ask for grace to follow out your intention and share your transforming energy among people who stumble and die for lack of it. Hear our prayers, O God of compassion, for all those across the world who long for peace and long for justice, who all who live, for all who live constantly under the shadow and threat of violence and destructive powers, for all those who have suffered recently as the result of natural disasters, for all those who lack the basic necessities of food and shelter, clothing and health care. God, we pray that your presence will come fully into our lives so that together with communities of faith and people across the world, we might together provide those resources and necessities which people lack so that we might help all individuals across the world and creation itself to flourish and to thrive, which is surely your intention for all of us. Hear our prayers that we might know the callings to which you have called us, that we might listen deeply and with deep consideration for your voice in the ever-changing circumstances of our lives, and that having heard your hopes and intentions for us, that we might respond fully and creatively and with great love give you thanks, O oh God, for your ongoing creative presence in our world, in all living things, and in creation itself. Help us to trust the movement of your spirit and to follow wherever it leads. And let us pray together in the words of the Round Hill Community Church Prayer, saying, Our Heavenly Father, shed forth thy blessed spirit upon all our lives. Make each one of us an instrument in thy hands for good. Purify our hearts, strengthen our minds and bodies, fill us with Christian love. Let no pride, no self-conceit, no rivalry, no ill will ever spring up among us. Make us earnest and true, wise and prudent, giving no just cause for offense. And may thy holy peace rest upon us this day and every day throughout the coming week, sweetening our trials, cheering us in our work, and keeping us faithful to the end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, it finally snowed in Greenwich this past week, but I know the daffodils are coming, and so is hope. So go forth in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you, now and always. Amen.